done a really cool line or been at the top where you're like super scared, thousands of emotions, like memorizing the line, super focused, adrenaline riding, holy shit, get to the bottom. Oh my God, when do I get to do that again? I was like, oh, this was good. This was good shit. Like right here, this is me being like, you know, knocked off my mini pedestal that I had myself on. Think everything that you thought you knew, like put it to bed, start new, be eager and like arrive there with an open mind. I have to say, I feel very lucky to have sat down with this beautiful lady who just absolutely crushes it on a snowboard. She has had a dominating career over the last decade, uh, even more than a decade now in snowboarding. Um, looking at her website, you can see that she's had multiple features in the press, in magazines, in videos. She's been a huge advocate for uh, women in snowboarding and equality. And she was just truly a pleasure for me to speak to and interview. And I will let the interview do the talking. So without further ado, Miss Robin Van Jin. I mean, I get super weird. I'm, I'm definitely like, you know, one of the things that we were talking about earlier where like life isn't always easy. I think, you know, there's this whole woo-woo movement of manifestation. And I very much believe in manifestation in a lot of ways, but it's coupled with, you know, having a vision and mission and putting in the hard work. And, Absolutely. you know, there's, there's a healthy balance of, you know, private practice equals pub public praise and stuff like that, where, you know, you're not just going to manifest a million dollars just by sitting and meditating and thinking about it. Most likely, May maybe it happens for some people on the random, but like, those are anomalies. And it's not statistically correlated to with every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, but you have you absolutely have to play in the physical world not just the, mm -hmm. the, the global consciousness world. Yeah, I agree. I agree that yes, manifesting, manifesting is a thing, but I also think, and for a while there, I was like, I manifested my, you know, career in snowboarding. Well, I'll tell you what, it wasn't just thinking about it. I mean, get here, you know, it was a lot of work, <laughs> a lot of work, a lot of like great times, a lot of shitty times. It was but ultimately the best. And everybody's like, dreams do come true. You can be anything you want. But remember, you do have to work for it. Anything good that you want, just, I mean, that's part of the journey. And the best part about getting to your end point is the journey of the work to get there. The struggle, it's sweet. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the best things about climbing a mountain and summiting it is the fact that you know you had to work your ass off to get there. The it's view really is cool. Have you seen that um that movie Zabardast? I haven't. That's it's a must watch. It's um made by this guy named Jerome Tannen. Uh, and he made The Eternal Beauty of Snowboarding, which if you haven't seen that, it's a must also. It's like a cult classic. Came out okay. a couple of years ago. They did this traverse in northern Pakistan. I can't, I can't like give you the, what do you call it when you spoiler alert I yeah. don't want to I don't want to spoil the movie but give it a watch it's an incredible movie and for all of the skiers listening to this right now I got a couple other suggestions for snowboard movies um, yep. there's one called Soft that I watched last night uh, Christian Holler um, and he made another one called Glue and also Contradiction which was uh, Elias Elhart who's amazing. Awesome. Anyway, Can you spell yeah. Zabardast? Can, you oh, know? yeah. Z, I'm oh, sorry, Z, <laughs> since you're American. Z A B A R D A S T. Zabardast. It's free on Vimeo. It's incredible. Incredible story about like being in the mountains and objectives and human psyche and what it's actually like out there. I think one of the, you know, one of the crazy things about humans is we can tell we can live an experience 
and then completely reframe the story of what happened after it happens. And it, it completely mm-hmm. can like, it's like you have a canvas that's been painted on that has this perfect picture. And then we can kind of come in and, and touch up the, the little things that, you know, make it more of a masterpiece and really like, sometimes the imperfection is actually more beautiful than the, the, the quote unquote perfection, but that's actually, yes. you know, manufactured perfection. Yeah, I agree. It's like the, it's wabi-sabi. It's like the perfection of everything in between. All yeah. of our imperfections are so perfect and beautiful that sometimes when we focus on being so perfect and being so like, I don't know, talented or whatever, whatever we're trying to do, make something so beautiful. But, but like, remember that like everything you do in between is so perfect. Yeah. There's like a true beauty in that, you know? There's a woman in snowboarding named Desiree Melanson. I don't know if you know about her. She's a artist and more like urban snowboarder. And she's been typically like the most outspoken person in snowboarding. Uh, maybe not in snowboarding, but the most outspoken female for sure. I would put her in the top five most outspoken people in snowboarding. But I love watching her because it's so amazing. The things that she says is so real. And she's not afraid to call people out and she's like very honest. And to me, that's so much more amazing than watching, you know, a perfect video of somebody shredding pow or like somebody doing a 1080. It's it's like this really cool thing to watch. Anyway, I have a lot of respect for her as a person just because of how real and raw she is. Yeah, totally. I I have mad amount of respect for anyone who is super authentic to their own journey and, you know, is honest about it. And, you know, I think something that like marketing for me, I do, you know, digital, run a digital marketing agency, digital, digital content creation agency and marketing is like almost all lies most of the time. You know, yeah, like, absolutely. <laughs> you just create this string of dots and you make people logically connect them in a way that's like you know and it's especially prevalent in the ski industry with the one turn wonders like especially prevalent in that where like Mm -hmm. and I'm not saying you know I'm, I'm with you on the total like being somewhat of a hypocrite or not being able to consistently 100% practice what I preach but there's a learning process to it as well, where I, you know, I've done the one turn wonders and I thought it was really fun for a while. You get a bunch of likes on Instagram. It's tight, but it's tight. Yeah. How tight is it really? Yeah. I I am fairly a little bit opinionated about that piece. And I I don't want to hate on it too much because it's like, if you can figure out a way to make money, however you do it, doing what you're into, like kudos. But I think it's important to remember, and I think we're in the age of influencers. And to me, I I guess I, I'm a little bit salty around, not salty, but I guess it makes me sad sometimes. And I'm like, how how is this such a big thing? These are the people who are getting all of the kind of lo- like internet love. But you have to remember too, it's like, you can look back at your career or what you've done and say that you've given back or like like done something good or inspired somebody in a positive way, then you're winning, you know, and it's different for a lot of the, not all the influencers. Some of them are so amazing and like really good humans doing good things, speaking out about something, but the ones who just look hot on the internet and don't do anything else, I have a really hard time with, you know, because I'm like, okay, what are, what are you selling? You know, you're selling like being hot on the internet. Like, is that what young women have to aspire to? Like, if you're going to do that, do something else with it. Like speak out against the environment or against the environment. (laughs) (laughs) Speak out against, you know, climate change and, or like whatever you're into women's rights, men's rights. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Aboriginal youth, like whatever, use your voice for something positive. And I think if you are doing that, And being hot on the internet, I don't hate on that at all. That's like, whatever you got to do, 
to make money and that's totally fine. You've figured it out. Congratulations. But if you aren't using your voice for something positive in some way, shape or form, then I think it's like, maybe I just don't have as much respect for that. Yeah, totally. Another (laughs) quote that I, you know, read in an interview that you've done is, is be strong, not skinny. And I think that that's, you know, it's super important to remember that like, just because you don't have the magic skinny gene or the magic, you know, whatever thing that, that makes you as quote unquote beautiful as what, you know, society may think that you should be, or, you know, for men, you know, like not having the, you know, being tall, dark, and handsome and having huge muscles, like, you know, that, there are a million different ways for you to show up in a way. And we're all influencers. We all yeah. influence the world around us. Yes. And remembering that like, just because you only have 500 or 100 or 50 Instagram followers, whatever, like your influence and especially in person, like we talked about before with your friends and your family and your community is worth so much more than, you know, what you do on the internet. Absolutely. It's important for people to remember like that beauty comes in like every way, shape or form. And I actually love the movement. Like we're seeing so many companies kind of celebrate different shapes. And, you know, I definitely have I a skinny jean and I, I couldn't give a fuck. And yeah. I'm like... I also always remember like at times of insecurity where I'm like, Oh, maybe I wish I was just a little bit skinnier. had like a smaller butt or like whatever, <laughs> or whatever I'm doing at that moment. Cause that happens to me. Yep. Um, but I don't think you, at least for me, like I wouldn't be able to land or do some of the things that I do with a different body. Yeah. And you just have to like, accept and be like, yeah, you know, right. I think like confidence is in yourself is like the most beautiful thing. You can always tell, like, I remember not even that long ago being at the beach and this woman, she was a bit younger than me, I think. And she was like really voluptuous and like kind of, I'll say it, I'll kind of dumpy, kind of dumpy body wearing like the smallest bikini. She just cooked up with like this like uncanny confidence and she all of a sudden became the most beautiful person in the room yeah. you know and you were just like yeah yeah <laughs> like owns it yeah and it's like the owning part of it that makes them seem so amazing definitely 100 yeah. percent agree on that you know there's a type of more woo woo shit Uh, there's a type of energy that people show up with and like that Mm -hmm. naturally attracts other people and it goes way past skin level to the point where like you see yeah you see someone that shows up that's just happy naturally happy Mm -hmm. with their life and you're like that motherfucker I want to hang out with them (laughs) like yeah absolutely but it's even like you kind of hear from people oh you just like that person because they're good at this you know like and that's a thing that's not fake. Like, of course you like that person because, or you think they're hot because they're good at skiing or good at snowboard or whatever it is, basketball. <laughs> I don't know. Darts. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know what it is? It's like the fact that that person has had the ability and or talent to dedicate time and energy towards something that they love. That's attractive. It's attractive to me when people are like talented at what they do not necessarily what they look like. And yeah, being good at things makes you more attractive, but not for the superficial reasons. It's like, think about it a little bit deeper. Like I have so much respect and for people who like dedicate their lives to being good at something or who have true love and passion. Like I'm like, that is awesome. Yeah. When somebody's like flaky and hot, you're like, yeah, I mean, you're hot. Right. (laughs) I'm not going to deny you that, but the the flaky kind of like unconfident part is not that attractive. Totally. I don't know how we got here, by the way. What? <laughs> it's crazy because it is a big part of skiing and there are a large amount of influencers that like 
maybe aren't representing the core ideals that other people would want, you know, to see represented, but they get a lot of love. And then it's like, you know, but it's a thing. It's just a thing. It is a thing. But I think like for any sort of person listening, I think for me, the, the thing I would like to say about that is to just focus on what you're doing and like do what you want to do. If you are, if you want to be a good skier and you want to be a good snowboarder, stick to that and don't focus on the other things. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Focus on yourself. And at the end of the day, when you look back on what you did, you're going to feel really good about it. You're going to be like, I tried really hard. I worked my butt off to be really good at this sport or to like be somebody amazing. And that is called integrity. (laughs) And that is much more important than being hot on the internet. 100 percent i love it <laughs> we'll get back to more on, Thank God. Go Thank on God. topic what's been your favorite part of the journey so far do you do you as being a professional snowboarder do you have a favorite part a favorite era a favorite lesson a favorite trip anything that pops out that you're like if i could live in that moment forever or if i could you know if i could live in the apre of this lesson or whatever it is that <laughs> I think just the traveling it's given me like as a a younger person being have being able or have had the opportunity to travel the world the way that I have is just so incredible and I will never take that for granted every time I'm overseas or like at in a different culture like it just gives you a more worldly vision and you can like go to different, like enjoying other people's reality. Like it's so amazing to go to somewhere like Italy and do apre with Italians and drink beer and eat pizza and, you know, then move along and go to Austria and like experience that, you know, eating like wiener schnitzel or whatever, (laughs) you know, it's just so incredible to be able to travel. And I am like, eternally grateful for that opportunity like snowboarding has given me that over everything the opportunity to see the world i i feel like so every day i'm like i am the luckiest person on the planet i have friends all over the world i have like experiences from like every little corner you know i live a comfortable life like this is sick i would way rather be have less money and have seen everything that i've seen you know, like I was actually thinking about it on a flight to Japan last year. I was in Hawaii with my family and I was flying to Japan to join Austin and Rusty Ockenden and Chris Rasman on a trip. Like if this plane crashed right now, <laughs> I wouldn't even care. I would have had like the most like incredibly fulfilled life, you know, like that's pretty cool. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not trying to die or anything, but you know. I definitely think about that a lot. I'm like, I've seen so much and that's like, what a gift. Yeah, seriously. I think, you know, the, like traveling, I grew up ski racing and I was able to go to several places from a young age and see a whole bunch of different cultures. And it, it makes you appreciate life in a different way, makes you understand how like actually beautiful the world is because you know we see the news about like all these different things that are happening and obviously a lot of the time the news only focuses on what's bad because it's the marketing it's what's going to get the fear you know turned up and it's what's going to attract people to make decisions and polarize and you know it's this whole thing and it's like when you get to travel and you get to see other people's cultures and you see how people invite you in you're like wow the world is an amazing place. It is so resilient. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I, I agree with that. I just like thinking about the different people I've met and like friends that I've made and the experiences like, holy shit, it's been good. Yeah. Totally. And like, hear me talk about like struggling with tomahawking. Like you think about that over all of that stuff. It's been like so incredible. I would never ever go back and change a thing i feel like i've been very lucky 
to live the life I do. And I'll never take that for granted. That's for sure. Totally. Do you have a favorite place that you've ever traveled? Like a favorite, like, I know you love Whistler. Spent <laughs> a lot of time in Argentina. Hey, what mountain in Argentina did you ski? Uh, yeah. Mostly um, Cerro Catedral in Ferroloche. Yep. That was like where I spent most of my time, but I spent a couple of years in Las Lanias also. And the first year I went, I was actually in Chile and I went to like Termasa Chian, which is now just Chian, I think. Yep. And uh, all Colorado and those, that area. But Argentina is very special to me. I think Buenos Aires is one of the most alive cities I've ever been to. And I love that they're kind of stuck in history. You know, they have like a weird import export tax rule system, which has kind of left everything, including antiques and stuff like that in Argentina. And it's kind of preserved. I don't know if it was single-handedly that, but they seem preserved in their history. And like tango is everywhere and music and color and like the football games. I went to a soccer game there and that was like, we talk about like global consciousness, but like that, the vibration in that stadium was something I will never forget. It was like this collective like chanting and the hum of people and the excitement. It was like contagious. It was incredible. Like I couldn't believe it. I had never really felt that before. Yeah. And it felt like really like I was, you know, that was one of the experiences that I've had that I'll, I'll never forget. And so I would say that Buenos Aires is definitely up there for me on the list. It's not the most beautiful in terms of like landscape, but just the culture, the city, it is so intact and real and amazing. It's just buzzing. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I love the, the condors in Cotijaral, like the, the massive yeah. birds you'll see flying around. Uh, like definitely one of my, uh, I don't know. Like one of my favorite things about South America is like the massive birds that you'll see just flying around. So cool. Yeah. And they like coast on the thermals. So it's always like a indicator. They're like an indicator bird, indicator dinosaur bird. Right. (laughs) One minute they're like dragging a goat. Next minute they're like up on the mountain, like soaring and being peaceful. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Yeah. Argentina is incredible. Totally. Do you have any things that you'd recommend people do if they were traveling in Argentina or I know you've surfed in Baja and Tofino, like any of those places that, uh, not giving away your, your local secrets, but things that you would suggest that people culturally experience that might open their eyes or, you know, leave them with memories that are unforgettable. Yeah. I think in Patagonia, especially I think there's a rule of thumb and that is go there for the sport but stay for the culture and experience something else at one point in time and you've probably experienced this in like ski racing it's like traveling around you go to the resort you go up the resort you do your shtick and then you go home but one thing I always try to do is tack on a day at the end Make sure you have a day in Tokyo to go see that amazing place or like spend an extra day, go to like a monkey onsen, like go see something cool. Don't just go there to do the sport. That's the whole point. Like if you go there and just do the sport, like, yeah, great. You're doing the sport. You can do that at home. It's not going to be like Baja waves for sure, but like spend the time to like go see everything else that the place has to offer. That would be my tip. My yeah. tip is to like go for the sport, stay for the culture. Love it. Do you do any sort of like, do you have any morning or evening routines and do you do any sort of meditation at all? I do yoga. Yeah. Um, pretty often, almost, almost every day. Yep. Um, I can't say every day, but my morning routine is like, basically I wake up one eye and I'm like, get me the coffee. I'm like a coffee fiend. And I know that it's like supposedly not good for you, whatever. Don't care. It's so freaking good. (laughs) Like sometimes I go to bed and I'm like laying down. I can't wait to wake up because coffee. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) I like travel with my coffee and 
I don't know. I just love it. It's like my little morning routine. Wake up, get so jazzed that you're like speaking out of turn and annoying. <laughs> <laughs> love yeah. it. But uh, that's kind of my routine. I'm, I'm very much like uh, as soon as I get down, another thing that I do uh, as soon as I get down from the mountain, I'm like a little obsessive compulsive about like getting everything charged straight away, all mm-hmm. my snow gear off. Yeah. So that's another like weird little thing that I do when I get home. I'm like, nothing else happens until everything's charged, everything's off and drying. And then I can like chill. Yeah. I, I have meditated. I can't say that I'm the best at it probably the coffee drinking that really gets in the way with that I listen to like meditation podcasts and like dream about meditating (laughs) but I'm not quite there yet yeah totally I think there's also like a kind of a there's a social media eyes thought process to meditation where everyone thinks like your brain is just gonna go empty like you're not gonna have any thoughts and it's gonna be this perfect blissful like (laughs) experience and something that I've like started to do is reframe meditation of like I think hiking is a form of meditation I think yoga is a form of meditation I think running can be a form of meditation where you literally you just get into this zone where you are processing thoughts but you're not holding on to them no and you're just thinking about the thing yeah like if you if you've ever gone on a long run, like you said, or a long hike, do you notice that you like the quietness and the not talking and the doing the thing allows you the time to? Th- of, it's not the not thinking for me. It's the thinking. It's the the time, the space, and the time to think about things while being quiet and like out in nature and being connected. And I feel like every time I meditate, same thing. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try and meditate. And then I'm like sitting there and I'm like thinking about this. I'm like, no, 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 wait, I got to go back to the nothing. That's what, it, that's what I was like, I'm supposed to go back to the nothing. And you like go back to the nothing. And then you're like, mind wanders. You're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I actually really, really have a hard time doing the nothing. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm not, I'm not good at meditating. That's for sure. Maybe it's that I'm thinking about stuff. I'd like to learn how to quiet the mind for sure. It's tough. I think, you know, probably like when I'm shredding, like there are moments where like nothing is going on. And I'm like, yeah, that that was my meditation for the day. (laughs) That's your flow state. Yeah. All you're thinking about is the action, is the doing. There's a book called The Rise of Superman, which talks a lot about flow state. And then I think it has a sequel called Chasing Fire that talks a lot about like just the moment, like when you're riding a face in Alaska, there is no opportunity to think about anything else. You're only thinking about that in that moment. Like what turn are you going to do where the snow's going? Like what, where you turn, where you go fast, where you go slow. You know, it's like, there's nothing going on in your brain. And that to yeah. me is like a form of meditation, I guess, or maybe it's just me trying to pretend that I'm a meditator and making excuses, just being like, yeah, no, I totally meditate while I'm spinning. <laughs> but um, I do hear all these like amazing athletes. They're like, well, yeah, I um, I meditate and I think about all this stuff. Quieting the mind is so important. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I, uh, should I be doing that? <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yeah, totally. I read an article recently that someone that was on the podcast last year, TJ David, posted and it was basically how a lot of top athletes don't actually know that much about nutrition and diet and they just kind of do what feels good and eat what makes their body feel good and I think that there's a you know especially in this age of information where we we see all these things of what you're supposed to do whether it's the ketogenic diet or fasting or meditating or, you know, like working out three days a week or five days a week or whatever it is. And it's like, well, why don't you just do what feels good? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely on that a little bit. I would love to tell you that I like eat super healthy and don't do any of the bad stuff, but I do. I drink beer. I eat croissants. I'm totally gluten. I like pizza, toast. I eat toast 
for breakfast. Like, and a lot of my friends and a lot of the people who I'm surrounded by are like so on it with like healthy fats and like making their gut better with like all these crazy, crazy diets. Like, but I just, to me, I just eat whatever is there and I, I eat good food. You know, it's not like I'm eating Cheetos. Yeah. Like I have toast and I eat eggs and, you know, I, have, I eat a lot of soup, eat fish and chicken, you know, like I, I pretty much eat everything. Yep. And I, maybe I'm, I could be more high performance probably. But at this point, I feel like the snowboarding that I do right now, for me, it's all about injury prevention, Yep. which is where yoga strength training comes in. And also a longevity, which is probably where that nutrition piece comes in. But I think I'm doing okay. I'm not like totally unhealthy. Like I eat chocolate and sugar, gluten, caffeine, all the things, but not excessively. I think it's not that I need to be way more high performance. I think for what I do, it's more more a learned experience that's giving me the ability to ride things properly. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Like the more you try and tinker with something that isn't broken, the more you have the chance of breaking it, I feel like. Yeah. And, and so- I, I like in general, don't drink a lot through this season um, or in the summer. I just don't drink a lot. I, I enjoy drinking with friends, like, but I'm never like excessively drunk. And I just kind of keep it mellow, like whatever works for me. I, I know that like, being gluten-free works for a lot of people. Unfortunately, I enjoy the taste of bread and croissants way too much to give it up. It like makes me happy. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I tried being a vegetarian one time. I went gray, went gray in the face. (laughs) I like had no energy. Like, okay, that doesn't work. Um, I've tried like going gluten-free I'm unhappy staring at the bread across the room going like that should be in my belly. (laughs) You know know what I mean? Like I like sandwiches. Why are sandwiches so bad? (laughs) Why is everyone hating on sandwiches? (laughs) Why is everybody hating like pizza? Like, oh, and like, don't get me wrong. I'm not unhealthy. Like I had a pretty, like I'm a pretty healthy person, but like I do enjoy all the things, but I think it's just what works for you. Like if you look at Danny Cass when he was at the top of his game, there was a lot of partying and smoking weed and like all that stuff. And he was still just the best. I know a lot of the very, very top, top athletes that like pretend to be super healthy, but are like very normal. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think we put so much emphasis on diet and I, I know that it's important, but I think actually doing a sport and like trying and don't focus too much on food people are like obsessed with it so much that it's annoying we're obsessed with food as a like as a culture in north america we are obsessed with diet and i understand why because we've had some like weird things go on with like food processing meats and processing wheat and all sorts of stuff and people are legitimately hurting and there's a reason why we have all these like crazy not crazy diets, but diets. There's a reason why people do them. But I think that in general, we put way too much energy and focus on that. Yeah. Where I think that we could just, you know, maybe put a little bit more energy and focus on other things. I don't know. That's my opinion. Not a fact. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think if we focused more on connection, connection to our food, connection to each other, connection to all of these things, then, you know, like, because there are a lot of mental health problems going around and some of it may be caused by diet, but a lot of it is probably caused from the feeling of isolation. The worst thing you can do to a person in prison in the worst place in the world is throw them in solitary confinement. Yeah. What, uh, uh, what philosopher was that? Who did that? Do you remember? There's the, you mean like this, the prison, the Stanford prison experiments or it was, uh, it was a enlightenment era philosopher, I believe from Italy who just, who wrote about that very famous. I can't remember his name, but he wrote about how 
solitary confinement is like the worst thing that you can ever do to to a human. Like it's the, the only way to like really make people not want to do whatever bad thing they did again. Like instead of jail, because jail actually puts everybody together, but it's the solitary confinement that is like actually the worst. There was like a whole book on it. Somebody's like yelling at their the radio right now on their <laughs> computer, like hey, it's this person, it's this person. I'll give you that dumb. Sorry, I can't remember. University was a long time ago. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> was it Rousseau? Jean Jacques Rousseau. Mm, that's a French guy. Yeah. I can't remember, but in speaking of French, when you're talking about connectivity and like eating, if you look at the French, for example, we as North Americans, we like eat when we're hungry. There's no ritual. There's no community in it. Well, there is sometimes. I mean, in my family, we definitely have like a ritualistic dinner where it's like all the the cooking and the sitting and the eating but we actually I had the opportunity to live in France when I was younger and I feel like a lot of that stems from my time there our family's time there but they really take the time to sit with each other and like talk and like make it a whole deal where they're like the food is actually the vessel to the connections between the people this is what we do together this is how we spend time together we're like cooking together and cleaning together and laughing and drinking wine. And like, they don't overeat. I don't know. They're not, there's not a ton of obese people there. They have a really good philosophy, like cultural philosophy on food. I really admire that about the French. They don't go to the grocery store and pile up for 10 days. They go to the grocery store for that day, maybe the next. Yeah. And I really like that. I've, I've tried to do that quite a bit where I just like, I'll go to the store and get like a few things. And it gives me the opportunity to leave the doors open if I get invited out to a friend's house. I'm not like, oh, well, I just bought all this food. I got to eat it. <laughs> you know, I'm like, yeah, great. I only have like an apple and a thing of yogurt. Perfect. I'm available from there. Like, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. As a society, we can get better at that for sure. Do you still not eat beef? I'm, I've recently started eating a little bit again, but not a ton. I don't uh, buy meat like red meat and I don't cook it. Uh, If somebody cooks it for me, I will eat it if I haven't told them that I don't do that, but I'm not super hard lined. I'll call, I'll say that I'm a selectitarian. Love it. The Mm -hmm. kind of the Buddhist philosophy of like, if you show up and there's, you know, if someone's put energy into creating a meal you'll you'll eat it not be disrespectful sort of thing yeah totally it's and it's more like now now more often than before we we have access to really good meats and i do think there's this really cool connection between hunting and plants and humans and kind of like I don't really know too much about it, but I was actually listening to Joe Rogan and uh, Shane Dorian, which that's, it's not my favorite podcast because a lot of the time they talk about MMA, but the ones where you get them talking about other things and like Shane was talking about bow hunting and bringing food home for his family. And to me, it, it shows like a really cool connection with um, the, you know, our environment and the animals in it. and. I think there was a book uh, written by Michael Pollan called uh, Omnivore's Dilemma. And he talks a lot about that, how people eat meat, but they don't want to see the animal killed. Yep. Where I really admire the people who will go out, hunt, bring it home, skin and, you know, butcher and then eat it. Like that to me is amazing. Yeah. And it's like, it's the cycle, you know, it's, yeah, no, I, I understand that like killing animals is, It's bad. It doesn't feel good. I I like love, love, love animals and like natural beings. Like I'm in love with animals, but at the same time, this is like part of the cycle of life. Like other animals eat other animals, and I don't know. Maybe I just don't have it figured out quite yet. But (laughs) I don't think it's the worst thing. Is basically what I'm boiling it down to. Yeah. Yeah. What was the reasoning behind Mm -hmm. not eating beef? for the period of time 
uh, environmentally, it was just the one thing, one easy thing I could do. One totally. easy thing I can do in my life to, tr- to uh, lessen my carbon footprint. And I know that a lot of people out there are going to be like, oh, yeah, well, what about all that heli time? And I know I'm a hypocrite. It's just the one thing I could do. You know, one, like, I don't have children. Check that box. And I don't eat beef. Check that box. Those are two little things that I can do. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else that you have explored in the idea of helping with climate change for, you know, any any other more relatively easy or not necessarily easy but yeah things that you've explored for trying to be more responsible hey you know what's a really easy way to have a big impact join protect our winters become a member canadians protect our winters canada yep when we have members we have a list of names that we take with us when you're lobbying the government Yep. And that it's so important to have members. Totally. And if there's one little teeny tiny thing you can do, it's become a member. It's not your money. It's your name on that list that helps us show officials at every level that we care or that we have a voice. And the more voices we have, the louder our collective voices. And it's really, really important right now. I feel like in the political climate that we have to kind of band together and just say, Hey, like, yeah, I do care. I I don't do a lot, but um, yeah, that's just a little thing that you can do in your life is be a part of the movement. Love it. Awesome. I'll ask you just a couple more questions. They will try and keep it more rapid fire, but some of them might end up down a little bit of a rabbit hole and then let you enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay. No rush at all. Like I, I blocked off this time for you. So I appreciate it a lot. So what does success mean to you? I feel like at this point I feel successful. I feel like I'm, I've done what I set out to do. I think it's achieving goals. Yeah. I'm like, I'm a goal setter. So, and I've achieved a, a few things that I'm really proud of. And to me, that's a success to like have a good life and live fulfilled, feeling fulfilled. I feel like that's a success. Yeah. Totally. I love yeah. it. What's one piece of advice you'd pass along to someone who wants to do what you do? I think staying true to who you are and being real is the most important. Don't be somebody that you're not. And it kind of goes back to that, like realness on the internet, <laughs> you know, cause that's what we're dealing with. We, we deal more with internet than we do with print nowadays. But I think if you're honest and real about who you are and you like stay true to that, you're going to be successful. Like actually doing what you want to do. If you, if it's not something you want, you'll never be that successful at it. Like truly want, you know? Totally. Cause it, I mean, it takes grit and discipline to move past the resistance of life to, to move past the tomahawks of life as we <laughs> framed it before. Yeah. You know, it takes grit to get back up and try it again. And if you're not really, truly passionate about whatever it is, I think, you know, you're not going to call it. Yeah, absolutely. There's a reason why I can take a thousand tomahawks. And I think it's, I've done it so many times and the want is bigger than the struggle. There's got to be a bit of a fire. There's no fire and like true want it'll it'll just be the struggle i don't think they'll they'll be that end point where you're like yeah yeah (laughs) yeah totally what's one technique you use to overcome fear or push through to like land a trick when you are struggling i mean i just visualize myself doing it first when i do it i always visualize the worst case scenario which is awfully traumatic (laughs) But you kind of have to go there to be like, okay, what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst thing that can happen? And then you like walk through that and you're like, okay, now how do I avoid that scenario? And then you visualize yourself doing it the right way through the whole line trick, whatever you're doing. 
it's like you kind of like visualize the stomp right out. And that's a big part of it. If you can't see yourself doing it, you're not going to be able to do it. That's one yeah. thing I've, I've been trying to learn to rodeo for, I think, seven years now. And I literally cannot visualize that trick. And I have never been able to do it. I've never even come close. Because I just can't, I can't, I, I couldn't understand what the trick was to start with. People would be doing like a half, like barrel rolly flip thing. I was like, what is a rodeo? And people would like show me a video and I'd be like, it just doesn't, like I, I, can't, I couldn't connect the dots. And I was like, but I really want to do that. I want to be able to check that box. But I could, I could never ever visualize anybody doing it. I could never point it out when somebody else did it. And I couldn't visualize myself doing it. And I've never been able to do it. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me in a year. I guarantee I'll be like, nope, still haven't done that. <laughs> I'll hit you I'm up. See, to kind of get it. see where progress is at. <laughs> yeah, totally. What's one piece of encouragement or wisdom that you've received that stuck with you, and who is it from? I think uh, my mom. She would always say, "If you're going to do something, be great at it." Love it. Yeah, and I, I think it's like whatever you choose to do, do it with grit. Yeah. With gusto, with integrity. Yep. Yep. And I enunciate integrity because it's something I'm really like focused on right now. Yeah. (laughs) I love it. For sure. If you could have one significant impact in the world, what would it be? Oh man, I would just love to inspire youth to look up to people with talent and not strictly beauty. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to be a like in terms of what I would like to give back in snowboarding other than like little other things that I do also but I really want to be able to be a positive role model like not for being good looking or having a a good body or like showing up in a bikini somewhere or like looking hot in my outerwear it's for like being great or being inspiring, like inspire people to like do something else other than look at their phones and go to shopping malls. I yeah. want to bring like youth outside. I want to bring them outside into my playground and show them how incredible it is. Yeah. Cause they're our future, you know, like if we can get them there and it's not just youth. Like we always say, like, let's get the youth there. And something that um, really resonated with me in the Ode to Mir film was when uh, Jeremy was talking about uh, John Muir and how the politicians used to go out into the uh, wild to meet. So they would all meet at like a fishing cabin or like a hunting cabin and they would discuss political matters out there. They were outside enjoying the great outdoors that we have, the most beautiful thing that we have, like right, right there. It's all right there. And nowadays when he talks to people, And he asks them that they get outside and they say they go like take a walk with their dogs. You know, to me, that's like the biggest disconnect that we're seeing in our political landscape versus the people. And like what we really want as humans is like, how can you protect something you don't know anything about? Yeah. And I think we're on the right track. Like not just youth, but people are like getting outside and enjoying our uh, incredible gift. Totally. Of a planet, you know? So we're getting there. But I think that's um, one thing I would like to do. And I forget even what the question was, but had something to do with that, maybe? Yeah, a significant impact you'd have in the world, which is yeah, is perfect. Help people get out of the shopping mall, out of their the internet, and back outside where we belong. Yeah, I have a project yeah. I want to talk to you about at some point down the line that I'll hit you up about probably in like six months or a year or whenever, but I think it'd be a fun, a fun project. And it's one of the things that I feel I want to see into fruition, no matter how, yeah, how long it takes me. So very cool. do you have a favorite travel tip or hack that you like constantly rely on when you are traveling? The one thing I always have with me if I'm traveling airports is a carabiner. Okay. So you can attach your snowboard bag or your ski bag to the top strap of your wheel wheelie. Like if you have a wheeling suitcase. 
Mm-hmm. So you attach the top of your ski bag, you put the carabiner through the top of the ski or snowboard bag, and then you put that same carabiner through the top of your wheelie bag, and then you tip the wheelie bag and drag, and you're only dragging one thing, and there is no weight. It drags itself. Yeah, it's like game changer for like your back and like long, long travels. That and always bring your own snacks. <laughs> and pack your underwear in your backpack and a yep. toothbrush. One yep. pair of underwear, one toothbrush. Love it. It's all all great info. You never know what's gonna happen. And then yeah, where's the best place for people to find you, follow you on your journey, learn more about you? I'm at Robin Van Jean. I also have robinvangine.com. And I don't do Twitter, sorry. But I'm on Facebook too. I'm just not really that great at it. So you can find me. I'm out there. If you really need to see me out, you'll find me at Robin Van Jean on Instagram. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. And I, yeah, this conversation was awesome. I appreciate it a ton. I just appreciate the time to to chat with you for two hours. It was awesome. Yeah, I appreciate you thinking of me for this podcast. I'm stoked to be the first snowboarder. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's kind of how I felt about TGR. I was like, not the first snowboarder, but I'm the first female snowboarder, and I'm cool with that. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah, loved it. Thank you again. I hope you have an amazing evening. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. You betcha. Great chatting with you. Okay, yep. bye. Bye. <laughs> Hey, just one more thing before you go. I wanted to say thank you so much for listening to today's episode. I hope that you really enjoyed it. A couple things that I would ask that you do if you enjoyed today's episode. Number one, go follow us on Instagram at The Athletic Stance Podcast. Number two, if you don't mind leaving a review, rating it, and subscribing, It always helps. It helps spread the word. It helps me know what you guys are enjoying or not. And if you don't mind leaving a comment on Instagram, letting me know what you're enjoying, what you're not enjoying, I will always take into consideration and feel free to send me a message with recommendations on who you'd like to hear from, what you'd like to hear us talk about. And as always, thank you so much for listening, for your time, and we'll see you next time at the Athletic Stance Podcast.